I'm going to read today from Romans chapter 1, and um, let's just see what Paul has to say here in verse 16. Now, in, uh, just by way of background, uh, Paul, usually most of Paul's epistles, many of his epistles, he's writing to his own converts. And so, you know, he traveled around the Roman Empire in his day and started churches um, through his own preaching, his own presentation of the gospel. And some of the letters that we have are like the Galatians, for instance, um, and the Corinthians. He's writing to his own converts, so he's already presented to them what he has to present. But with the Romans, we know from reading in chapter 1, uh, he knows that there are Christians in Rome, but he has not met them. So the reason I bring that up is it's uh, important to keep in mind because not knowing them, they haven't heard his message. They haven't heard him preach. So he's taking this opportunity to lay it all out in this letter. So Romans is one of the most uh, thorough or elaborate presentations of Paul's message. And also in kind of a formal way because he's not just you know, speaking to them in a public setting. He's got time to lay it all out in a systematic way. So it's very complete and thorough. And um, unfortunately, uh, you know, in a setting like we're in right now, we, we don't really have time, of course, to read the whole thing. But uh, it's, a, it's a very broad and a complete picture. And it's beneficial to ha have a grasp of everything he's got to say. But he begins his presentation in verse 16. Um, he says, well, back up to verse 15. Sorry, Torn. Verse 15, Paul says, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And I, I observe from this that he knows they're Christians already. He says that earlier on. He says, I've heard of your faith in the Lord, and I know, you know that you're Christians. Um, and, but he says to these Christians in Rome, he says, I want to come to you and preach the gospel. So what I gather from that is this message that he had to present, he considered it something useful or beneficial or important for Christians uh, to know and to be cognizant of, an important perspective, we might say. So then in verse 16 he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, that is in this gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now there's quite a lot actually in those two little short verses. First of all, in verse 16 he says, uh, this message that I have, it's the gospel of Christ. The word gospel literally means good news. Um, and the reason it's good news is because it's about Christ. Sometimes, you know, in the church world, when we come to church, we sometimes have this expectation that we're going to hear a message directed to us, like change your behavior, and you need to do this, and you need to do that. Well, if that were the message, that would not be a message of good news. That would be a message of bad news, just to be honest with you. The reason the gospel is good news is because it's not about you. It's not about you doing anything. It's about Christ and Him doing something. Uh, one writer that I like uh, wrote a book uh, called The Normal Christian Life. It's a good book, and, and there was a little line in there that I liked that he said, uh, the gospel is, is not a message about you and what you do for God. It's about God and what He does for you. And that's the right perspective to have, and that's Paul's perspective about it. So he says, I've got this message here. It's, a, it's good news because it's about Christ. It's the gospel of Christ. Then he says it's the power of God. This message is the power of God resulting in salvation. Uh, and I always like to point out that this word salvation, this is just a term, an umbrella term we might say, to say you are now under God's favor. You're brought into a position of, a favorable position with God, you might say. Salvation, saved, these are words that imply safety or security or safe position, you might say. Um, just like in a baseball game, you know, when the player runs around all the bases and he slides into 
home, the umpire says, safe. I think that's the symbol, isn't it? Is that what they do? <laughs> they have this little symbol, the umpire. Safe, he's now, he's safe. They can't, he can't be taken out by the opposing team. Uh, that's what the word salvation is talking A position of safety, a position of security where God is concerned. A position of favor, if I can say it that way. And then he says, it's for everyone that believes. And then he doesn't add anything to that. And again, the point I want to draw from that is, it's not uh, a matter of, it's not a reward for certain kinds of actions, for good behavior. I think a lot of Christians think that. I think most of the probably people in the world that are not Christians think that. That uh, a position of safety, a position of rightness with God is uh, a, a reward, or if you want you know, put it one way, going to heaven when you die, that's the way most people think of it, uh, is a reward for good behavior. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, uh, I've got a message uh, of salvation and it's a reward for good behavior. He could have said that, but he doesn't. He says, it's the power of God for salvation for everyone, and he just puts one stipulation, believe. And the word believe just means uh, that you d choose to place your confidence, that you, in other words, accept it, uh, that you say it's good enough for me, that you agree, in other words, that you consent uh, to it. Uh, then he adds to the Jew first, also to the Greek. The reason that expression is in there is because Jesus appeared, first of all, in the nation of Israel. They were the people of God in the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant draws a little narrow circle around one specific group of people the nation of Israel, and they were in that position of rightness with God because of that covenant. In the new covenant, uh, when Jesus appeared, he came to them first. Uh, they were first in line, you might say, as the people of God in the old covenant, but before he made a new covenant, he came and presented it to them first. As John tells us in his gospel, uh, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. That is to say, most of them rejected it, and the leaders certainly rejected it. And then he adds, Paul adds also to the Greek. That's just a term meaning everybody else, the Gentiles, in other words. Um, then in verse 17, he says, In this message, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Now, he does not mean that in this message, God's own righteousness is revealed. What he means is a, a rightness with God is revealed. In other words, not that God himself is righteous. Everybody already knows that. But what is revealed by the gospel is how we become right with God. Or, I'm going to say it this way, because I think this is what Paul's getting at. We are brought into a position of favor. We are the beneficiaries of God's favor. And the only thing we've added to it, the only thing we bring to this is our consent, or that we believe, that we choose to place our confidence in it. Uh, I was looking at some different translations of these two verses. Let me read you. This is the Phillips translation. Unfortunately, I don't have it on the screen here, so you'll just have to listen. This is by a man named J.B. Phillips. Uh, he translated the New Testament into, in his day, modern English. By that, I mean back in the 1950s. <laughs> it's still pretty much the way we speak today. Unlike the King James, which is 400 years old, and you have to explain a lot of the words. But uh, this Phillips translation is actually very good. And here's what he says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I see it as the very power of God working for the salvation of everyone who believes it, both Jew and Greek. I see in it God's plan for imparting righteousness to humanity. A process began and continued by their faith. As the scripture says, the just, or those who are in this right position, that's what just means, the just shall live by faith. Uh, I like the way he says that. I see in it God's plan for imparting righteousness to men. Now, that's what, it's, that's what Paul's point is here in this book of Romans. How we, uh, as human beings, who, let's just be honest about it, are, are imperfect. I've never yet met anybody yet who says, well, look at me, I'm perfect. Mostly what people say is, I may not be perfect, but, and then if we can find somebody worse than us, then we feel more comfortable. Is that how it works? We say, I may not be perfect, but at least I'm not as bad as, you know, 
and, and conveniently, we have a prison here uh, east of town. So we can, everybody in town can say, at least, I may not be perfect, but at least I'm not as bad as the people at BJCC. And I go out there on Sunday nights, and I tell them that sometimes that people say, I know, they, I know that people say that. Uh, I know for a fact, you know, I used to go out, when I first started going there, I went with a guy named Merlin Booty, and I don't know if any of you knew him or not, but he was very boisterous. Did you ever know Merlin Booty? Yeah. Uh, Marianne? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I thought maybe he might. Anyway, he's not around anymore. He's gone to be with the Lord. But he, he and I started going out there together. Unlike me, he was very outspoken, very loud. I'm kind of an introvert. He was the opposite. He was an extrovert. He was just shout, you know, and sing right, you know, at the drop of a hat. Anyway, so he picked me up uh, to take me out there. And, and one night he picked me up and he said, well, let me tell you what happened last week when I dropped you off after our prison meeting. I said, okay, tell me. And he said, uh, I, I stopped at the convenience store south of town. What is that one, the Jiffy Trip or Night and Light or something? The one going out south, you know. Anyway, he stopped there to get a drink, uh, Coke, you know. So he said, I went into this store, and uh, the woman behind the counter said, what's that? He was wearing his volunteer badge around his neck. He forgot to take it off. And she said, what's that? And he said, well, that's my volunteer's badge. Uh, I go out to the prison, to BJCC, and we have a little Bible study. And he said, when he said that, she got all huffy, like got all drew in a breath, kind of puffed herself up, like kind of proud. She says, well, I'll tell you what, they're getting what they deserve. That's what I think. <laughs> and then he said, he told me, I said to her, well, I hope you don't get what you deserve, <laughs> you know, which is a good answer. You know, that's it. But see, that, that's very telling to me because that's kind of the normal human attitude. As long as I can point to somebody else and say, well, they're worse than me, and then somehow we feel like that makes us better. But not in the sight of God, you see. It doesn't make any difference in God's sight if you're, uh, if you're better than somebody else. He doesn't have a sliding scale. It's got to be, listen, it's got to be, he's perfect. So if you, now listen, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it tells us how we can have this position of safety, this right relation with God, position of his favor. You see, if God is perfect, and he is, you have to be perfect, or you have to have a perfect Savior. That's why Paul says this is the gospel of Christ. He's the only one who measures up. He's the only one who is righteous. As you go on reading in this letter to the Romans, Paul even says that specifically. Here, we might as well read it. Uh, Torin, this is in chapter 3, um, verse 10. Verse 10 says this, and he's quoting from uh, the Old Testament here. To sum up his point, he says in verse 10, very important verse here, uh, there is none righteous, no, not one. You know what that means? That means nobody measures up. That means it doesn't matter if there's somebody over here that's, that's not as good as you. You're not good enough. Nobody's good enough. No, there's none righteous. No, in other words, nobody measures up to God's standard. But the good news of the gospel is that we are given as a gift, imparted to us a condition of favorability with God, compliance, um, brought into a right relationship with God because we put our faith in the one who is already righteous. Here's how he says it in, uh, skip over here in chapter 3, Torin, if you'd give me a verse 21. He says, but now the righteousness of God, or we could say it this way, being right with God, being in a right relationship with God, without the law. You see, the law was all about you and what you're, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Paul says, but now a being right with God, apart from the law, without the law, is manifested. In other words, it's revealed. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Verse 22 says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. We could say it this way, a rightness with God, a position of favor with God, which is by faith of Jesus. In other words, faith in. The word of always means pertaining to uh, from the Greek language. Faith pertaining to Jesus, faith in Jesus. A righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. And listen, unto all, that is to say to all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. He says, 
it's for everybody without distinction. So we don't have to say anymore, I'm better than this person. I'm, we can forget about all that. It's unto all and upon all them that just do one thing, who believe. We could say it this way, who consent, who choose to place your confidence in this message and in Christ. And then he says, for there is no difference. See, he, he lays it out here. He specifically, particularly says, there isn't any human difference. Here's why, verse 23. For all have sinned. Now, you know, I heard one person say, I, I did an intensive word study of the word all and looked it up in all the different translations, looked it up in all the different dictionaries, and what I determined was the word all means all. <laughs> <laughs> it means, in other words, it's universal. It's all-inclusive. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's verse 23. Did you know sometimes I like to take a little survey and I ask if you've ever heard that before. And you know what I find? Almost everybody has heard this before. Almost everybody, and especially when I go out, you know, on Sunday nights I like to ask these men, I say, how many of you have ever heard Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Every hand, everyone has heard that. Because preachers love to preach this. I said, how, you've all heard that. How many of you know what the next verse says? No one ever knows. No one ever knows what the next verse says. Why? That's what my question is. Why do we know this one? Well, the reason we know it is it's quoted by preachers all the time. But why don't they include the next verse? Because you don't get the complete thought until you read the next verse. Yes, he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But verse 24 says, look at what it says being justified freely. That is to say, the same all that come short of the glory of God are justified freely. That is to say, you know what justified means? It means brought into right alignment. In the Greek language, which we can't see because we're reading an English translation, uh, we can't see behind the scenes to see what word is translated justify. Do you know what it is? It's the exact same Greek word that's translated righteous. Righteous, righteousness, just, justify, it's the exact, precise same word. You could say it this way, being made righteous, being made right, being brought into compliance, being brought into right alignment, being made right where God is concerned, brought into God's favor, you might say, being justified freely. And by the way, I just have to stop here and say I love the word freely. Freely means well, what does that mean to you? Uh, it means openly, uh, without any restrictions, without any strings attached, without any qualifications. He's trying to get across to you the bigness and the greatness. And that's why he said in the beginning, he said, I've got a message here and nobody's going to move me off of it. Uh, I, I'm excited about this message. And it's a big message. I mean, it's really, it's broad and it's for everyone being justified, and again, keep in mind who he's talking about. The same all who sinned and come short of the glory of God are now justified freely by his grace. And I've been saying here that this idea of being right with God, it's an idea that means brought into a position of favor with God. Uh, being brought into a favorable position with God the recipient of his favor. That's what grace means, God's unmerited favor. It literally, the Greek word means gift, the gift of his unmerited favor through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You know, this uh, chapter three is really good, especially the second half here. And I, I don't have time to read it all, but it's really good. And if we had time, we'd read it all. But I want to skip down to chapter four now because I'm, I'm getting at a point. I just want to gloss over some of the things that he's saying here to get them in your mind. Um, chapter 4 begins with, uh, verse 1 says, what, what shall we say that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? Now, he uses Abraham as an example. It's as though he's saying, let me just show you what I mean. Let me just illustrate it for you by talking about Abraham. So here's the point he wants to make. Verse 2, for if Abraham were justified by works, that is to say, if Abraham came into this position of God's favor, if he earned it, if he earned it by what he did, by his work, in other words, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. He means 
If Abraham had acquired or achieved this position through working for it, he could have boasted about it. Verse 3 says, but what saith the Scripture? In other words, is that what the Bible tells us? Is that what the Scripture says? No. It says Abraham believed God. Paul emphasizes that the only thing Abraham did was he believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. That's exactly what it says when you read it in Genesis. God came to Abraham and made a promise to him. He said, Abraham, your offspring will be like the sand of the sea and like the stars of the heavens. And then it says, Abraham believed it. Now, the reason that's significant was Abraham was already an old man and his wife was far past the age of childbearing. Yet when God came to him with this outrageous promise, it said Abraham believed it. Now, what he's going to say later is, Abraham considered that the one who made the promise was able to pull it off. I, that's my paraphrase. He believed the, the one who promised was able to achieve it. So, what, you know, what did he have to lose? He might as well agree with it. There's no way he was going to do it. Uh, it said Abraham believed God, and God counted that to him for righteousness, uh, for being in right relation. He counted, it, you know, he counted him as righteous after that. Now, this is a big deal. Well, let's go on reading. I'll tell you why it's a big deal. Verse 4. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but debt. In other words, if you worked for it, it's not a gift anymore. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. That's so remarkable to me. He makes right the ungodly. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. The only thing God's looking for is your trust or your reliance or your confidence in him. The fact that we make mistakes, the fact that we're flawed, is irrelevant to the question. The only thing he wants for you is to trust him. And then, to illustrate that, he quotes David. Verse 6 says, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom... God imputeth righteousness without works. Now he's going to quote from the Psalms, and he's going to say, David describes how great this is, what a wonderful thing, how big it is uh, to be in right relation with God, apart from having worked, without having worked for it. Verse 7, here's a quote from the Psalms. I think this is a quote from Psalm 32. He says, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Now, you know what? I could, I could go into any church in the world and quote that verse and everybody would nod their heads and say amen. I think everybody, there's a consensus about that, uh, that God forgives sins. Everybody agrees with that and whose sins are covered. I think generally everybody agrees with that. But you know what? Paul's not done yet. It's this next verse that is so radical that the next verse, see the same churches that will applaud when you say, uh, those whose iniquities, uh, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and those who are covered in verse 10. Uh, they'll call you a heretic and kick you out if you read verse 8. Listen to this. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Do you know what that means? That means he won't charge you with sin. He says when you're in this position of rightness with God, he won't take sins into account anymore. He won't count your sins. He won't lay them to your charge. He won't, uh, he's not... In other words, he considers it a moot question. He's already, it's, it's like this. It's like if he went into court and the judge bangs the gavel down and he says not guilty. That means you're not guilty. That means you can't be charged with it again. So after God has universally said, where you are concerned, not guilty, then all the charges are put away. That's what he means. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now let me tell you about Abraham, why I said you need to realize why this is such a big deal. Once Abraham entered into that condition with God, God never found fault with him again, even though Abraham did some pretty outrageous things. Uh, Abraham lied. Now, you know, if you don't have to be in church too much, you know that's not something you're supposed to do. Uh, they, Abraham and his wife Sarah traveled into Egypt, and uh, when they got there, Abraham said, now, we're going to say that you're my sister instead of my wife because when the Pharaoh sees how beautiful you are, he'll want to take you into his harem and naturally I'll be killed. So in a craven, self-serving way, 
he told Sarah to lie, and he lied about it. When they came in, sure enough, uh, he lied about it. He said, no, it's not my wife, it's my sister. And so then Pharaoh took her into his harem, and then he had a dream from God saying, you better not touch her, she's another man's wife. And so Pharaoh had to come back and say, why did you, why did you lie to me? Well, do you know what? Abraham lied to Pharaoh about it, but God never did anything about it. That never disqualified him from receiving the promise. And then if you go on reading, and I'm not going to take time to go read it, he did it again, twice this happened. They went into another place, and he said, well, say you're my sister. And not only that, but Sarah lied. When the angels came on their way to Sodom uh, to go deal with that, uh, they said, now, when we come back this time of year or next year, you're going to have a child. And she laughed. And the angel said, why did she laugh? And she said, I didn't laugh. And the, the text said she laughed. But she said, no, I didn't laugh. No, no uh-uh, not me. She lied about it. You know, God never found fault with them about that, Abraham or Sarah. He never held it against them. It didn't disqualify them from receiving his promise. He did not impute their sin to them because they were in a condition of rightness, of righteousness. And Paul is saying, you know what? This is like what we enjoy as Christians. We are in a position of God's favor. He does not impute sin to us. I don't know how else you can read that. Now, I never want to read this passage without uh, going back and give, giving you the message because I think it's so pointed and so good. Torin, if you'd go back to verse 1 and give me the message. I think this really drives the point home. So how do we fit what we know of Abraham, our first father in the faith, into this new way of looking at things? And by the way, uh, here we are, 2,000 years after Paul wrote this. Think of that. 2,000 years later. Not just 100 years. Not just 200 years, 2,000 years after Paul wrote this, it's still a radical and a new way of looking at things. I know from firsthand experience that this is a radical, you know, basically all I'm doing is reading to you what it says here and then explaining it. And still, people get upset. People get mad. I hear about it because they call and tell me, <laughs> which is another thing I don't understand. If I hear somebody say something I don't like, I just, oh, well, it's free country. Say what you want. I'll say what I want, and then everybody's happy. But no, it's not good enough. I get confronted at the gas pump and on the phone and at the grocery store and everywhere you might imagine. Um, so uh, it's, still a, it's still a new way of looking at things. That's the point. Okay, give me the next verse, Torn. If Abraham, by what he did for God, got God to approve him, he could have taken credit for it. See, if that's what... If that, everybody thinks that. That's what everybody naturally thinks. If you get God's approval uh, by working for it, uh, then we can all take credit for it, you see. Uh, if that's what Abraham did, he could have taken credit for it. But the story we're given is a God story, not an Abraham story. This gets down to the heart of the matter. We're talking about God's work, not your work. We're talking about something God does, not something you do. Okay, let's have the next verse. What we read in Scripture is Abraham entered into what God was doing for him. And that was the turning point. He trusted God to set him right instead of trying to be right on his own. That's a very profound thought. He trusted God to set him right. See, that's what the core of this message is. You trust God to do the work, not trying to do it on your own. Okay, let's get the next one. If you're a hard worker and you do a good job, you deserve your pay, but we don't call your wages a gift. Okay? Next one. But if you can see the job is too big for you and that it's something only God can do, and you trust Him to do it, you could never do it for yourself, no matter how hard or how long you worked. Well, that trusting Him to do it is what gets you set right with God by God. A sheer gift. See, that's what he's saying. That's how you should look at it. Uh, you should see that the job is too big for you, but instead you trust God to do it. In other words, I might look at my life and say, there's, there's no way I can live up to what God requires. So I'm just going to give up and trust Jesus. Now it's all about my trust in Him, not my trust in myself. That's what it means to believe in Christ. It means you don't trust in yourself anymore. Now you're trusting in Him. Sheer gift. That's what gets you set right with God. Now, I hope you can see by the, the limited verses that we've read so far, Paul is describing a condition where you are the recipient, and we are. And he used Abraham as an example of God's favor. We are in a position of favor with God. 
And again, in, the, in a setting like this, we don't have time to analyze every single verse and every single detail uh, because it, it's really, really good. But I'm going to skip to where he concludes. If you ever want to know what something's about, skip to the conclusion, then he sums it up. This is in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. In turn, I'm going back now to the King James translation. There's a point I'm driving at here that I want to get you to see. Here's how he sums up. He spent eight chapters describing what it means to be in a position of rightness with God. This position he calls righteousness, or the recipient under God's favor. And he specifically makes the point that you didn't get yourself there. You didn't earn it. It's not because you prayed hard enough. It's not because you worked hard enough. All those things are, 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 are irrelevant. It's because you did one thing, you trusted in Jesus as a Savior, and now you're in a right relationship with God, a condition of His favor. So Paul sums it up here in verse 31. What shall we say to these things? These things I've been describing for eight chapters. If God be for us, who can be against us? Now that's the point he wants to get across. That's a rhetorical question, by the way. The question mark, you know what a rhetorical question is? It's a question that is meant to be so obvious that, that the answer is obvious. Uh, he could have said it this way. Uh, God is for you, so who can be against you? God is for you, so nothing can be successful against you. That's what he's saying. You have God's favor, so anything else you encounter in life cannot be successful against you because God is for you. He wants to drive home this point and make it a rock-solid foundation under you that you are the recipient of God's favor, that His favor rests upon you. And he says, if God be for us, who can be against us? But notice what he says a little later. Let's just go and read him. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You know what he's saying there? He's saying, if God sent Jesus to the cross to die for you, to put you in this right relationship with Him, don't you think He can take care of all the lesser things too? Yes. He's saying, yes, He can. Everything else is less important than that. He can take care of all the smaller things that you encounter along the way. Verse 33 says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. In other words, who's going to bring accusations against you? God's already banged the gavel down and said, not guilty. Verse 34, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God making intercession for you. He's saying, don't ever think that, that uh, don't ever feel bad or, or condemn yourself or let any other kind of a thought come to your mind condemning you. Here's what you should think instead. Christ died for me. And then he says, no, it's, it's bigger than that. He rose again. And now he's standing at the right hand of God pleading your case, you might say, as a living um, guarantee of what he's already done, making intercession for us, speaking on our behalf for the throne of God. And then he says in verse 35, listen to this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Why does he bring that up, by the way? You know, here's why he brings it up. Because he's trying to be real about it and say, you know, as you walk through this human experience, there are going to be things that come along across your path that will seem to contradict this position of favor that you're in. In other words, he's saying here, uh, what can be successful against us? But then he says here, um, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Paul experienced all those things. He's saying, yes, you may encounter some problems. Thankfully, I could say, and I think you can too, you've never encountered, you know, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. You know, we, the first one, tribulation, just means pressure, by the way. Tribulation, the Greek word, thalipsis, means pressure. Now, we all encounter that. But, you know, here's the point he's getting at. Just because you encounter obstacles, just because you encounter difficulties, don't let it fool you. Don't let it distract you from the fact that you are under God's favor, even if other things come along that seem to contradict it. And then in verse 36, he quotes from the Psalms. He loves to quote from the Psalms, I've noticed. Paul does. This is from Psalm 44. And, and let's read it, and then let me tell you why he said this. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted sheep for the slaughter. 
He's putting this in here as if to say, now listen, is this how it is? You may feel this way. You may, this may be the thought that runs through your mind. But then verse 37, it's as though he's saying, is this how it is? Nay. Nay means no. No. He said, it's not how it is. We're not accounted sheep for the slaughter. We're not killed all the day long. And God's, you know, off doing something else, not paying attention. He says, no, in all these things, and by that he means all the things he mentioned, uh, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, all these things that might seem to contradict the fact that you have God's favor. He says, no, even in all those things, we are more than conquerors. And here's the key thought, through him that loved us. We're not conquerors because we're so great. We're not, and in fact, not just conquerors. He says more than conquerors. That just means above and beyond, super. The word is hooper nikeo in the Greek language. Hooper is our, it's like our word hyper. It means above and beyond. Nikeo means victory. Not just victory, but above and beyond victory. Conquerors. You come out on top, in other words. Through him that loved us. You see where he's always putting the emphasis, not on you and your performance, but on him that loved us. Then, then he sums it up and says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, in verse 38, uh, angels or principalities, powers, things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think he just throws in here at the end everything he can think of you know, from the highest to the lowest, the whole spectrum of things. Nothing can get in between God's love for you. And the only thing we bring to this is our uh, consent. Uh, that's what believing means, our, our faith in it. Now, I said all that to say, I want to show you an example of what to do when things, see, if we're honest about it, there's some pretty harsh things that happen in life, some pretty tough things, some bad things, some challenges, some pressure. He's already mentioned that. I want to look at how Paul himself, the one who said all this, how he dealt with it. And uh, I think it's a good illustration for us. This is in Acts chapter 28. I'm going to start reading with the first verse. The man who said all those things we just read, here's what happened when he experienced uh, some trouble. This is Acts 28. Oh, and when this verse starts, when this chapter starts, he's already had some significant trouble. He's had a lot of trouble in, in the book of Acts. Uh, just to sum it up, he, he was arrested. The Jews arrested him in the temple and falsely accused him. And then he appealed, and I'm skipping over a lot, he appealed to Caesar. And by the way, at that time, it was Nero, not the greatest person to be the judge of your case, but Paul was a Roman citizen, so he appealed to Caesar. And so these centurions have him, they put him on a ship, and they're taking him to Rome. And a big storm came up in the previous chapter, and uh, they had to throw everything overboard, and uh, the ship that was broken apart, but they washed up on this island. So here they are on this island. So Paul's already been through a lot. And it says in verse 1, when they were escaped, they knew that the island was called Melita. Verse 2, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. Uh, this is uh, language uh, that was used just for anybody who was not part of Roman culture. They called them barbarians. Um, doesn't, you know, don't get the wrong idea. It just means they were not Romans. They were not part of the Roman civilization. So anybody that's not a Roman, part of Roman civilization, they're called barbarians. So the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. In other words, they were kind. <laughs> that's King James language. They kindled the fire. They received us, every one, because of the present rain, because of the cold. There had just been a storm that destroyed their ship, you see. Verse 3. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat, that is, a snake, a poisonous snake, a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Verse 4 says, And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. Now, uh, Paul, you see, he wasn't doing anything wrong here. In fact, he's just been just attack after attack. Uh, I mean, just thing, you know, one thing after another, you know. If you read about his story, it's, it's as though he can't, even, he can't even go anywhere 
without a riot breaking out. If you read about the book of Acts, he goes to a town and preaches. Next thing you know, there's a riot. So they're throwing stones at him, so he's got to run away to another town. A riot breaks out. You know, and when he wrote to some of his converts, the Corinthians, in the second letter to the Corinthians, he said he finally perceived that, uh, he said, this is not normal, <laughs> you know, for all this to be happening. He said, there is a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. Uh, and he said, I prayed about this three times, and what the Lord told him in response to that is, my grace is enough for you. That's what he told him. When he said, I figured out there's, a, there's devils after me causing these riots. And so he prayed about it. What do I do about this? And Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. You know what that means? That means you, Paul, are the recipient of my favor. Now, it's not just Paul. It's you, too. And if you would hear this, he would say it to you, too. My grace is sufficient for you. Even though you encounter difficulties in life, his favor, his unmerited favor, it's nothing you worked for. The only thing you can claim is that you place your faith in Christ, the one who's righteous. Um, his grace is enough for you, his favor. His favor rests on you, each one of you as individuals, just like Paul. But here now, Paul is doing nothing wrong. He's throwing the sticks on the fire and a snake jumps out of the fire and bites him on the hand. Now, you know, the first reaction most of us would have is, what did I do to deserve this? You know, I must have done something wrong uh, for this to have happened to me. No, it's not true. You know, yeah, yeah, you can go back into your past and you can find a lot of things wrong, but it's got nothing to do with it. That's the point. It's got nothing to do with it. Uh, Paul wouldn't do anything wrong here. Now, the next thing I want to say about this is, how do you deal with it? When something happens that, see, this seems to contradict what he just got through saying, that we are under God's favor, that his grace rests upon us, that his favor rests upon us. But you see, he already hinted at it in that passage we read from Romans chapter 8. Uh, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall famine or persecution or tribulation or snakes jumping out of the fire? <laughs> does, that, does, that disqual does that contradict does that uh, disqualify? Does that mean that God's favor has gone away? Do you have to do something? To, how do you do it? What do you do about it? Do you get in a battle about it? Listen to what he did. I think this is really great. See, the people, oh, then, to top it all off, it's not bad enough that the snake jumped out and bit him on the hand. Now he's got to deal with all the people watching. Well, he must have been a murderer. <laughs> yeah, that's why this happened. That's how people are, you know. They look around. People are watching all the time, and they're, Eager to make judgment. Well, you know why this happened? Well, that, you know, he must have done something wrong, something we don't know about. You know, that's how people are. People are mean, you know. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. People can be very mean. Uh, they said, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not. He must have done something to deserve this. But Paul knew better. This is why I'm using this as an example, because we should know better too. Paul knew that the grace and the favor of God rested upon him because of no other reason than he had a savior named Jesus. And that's the only reason. And you're in the same condition Paul was in. Look at what it said here. Verse nine, he shook the beast off into the fire and felt no harm. That's it, that's it. <laughs> he shook it off. You see, and the reason I bring that up is I think that's such a colorful phrase. We have to do the same thing it doesn't say that he carried it with him for the rest of his life. <laughs> he shook it off. You notice that he didn't start a, uh, a Facebook group called Snakebite Victims Anonymous or something. You're supposed to laugh at that. That's supposed to be a joke. He didn't carry it for the rest of his life, in other words. He shook it off. You see, that's what we have to do when things come along in our lives that seem to contradict the fact that we're under God's favor. You've got to just shake it off. Sometimes people say things that hurt your feelings. And I'm not denying that that's real. I'm just saying you've got to shake it off. Sometimes things happen that are not good, that are not right. You've got to shake it off. You've got to just shake it off and recenter your attention on the fact that you are under God's favor. Paul said, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the point is nothing. 
He says, I've, I'm convinced, is what he said, I'm convinced that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Uh, he said, I'm persuaded. And the reason he wrote that to the Romans is he wanted us to be persuaded as well. And the reason I'm taking time to read all this to you is I want you to be persuaded. I want me to be persuaded. We need to be convinced or persuaded. Uh, that we are in a position of favor where God is concerned. And when things come along, like, like this snake that jumped out of the, the sticks here and bit him on the hand, uh, all you need to do is you shake it off. Well, I'm shaking that off. <laughs> you know, sometimes people say things to you. Well, thank you for your input, but I'm shaking that off, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, okay, I think that's all I got today. Let's all stand up. Bye.